Hey everyone, welcome back to another exciting episode of Primetime News. We've got a lot of important updates to go over today. eBay, USPS, FedEx, and more. We've got stories on the lighter side, but we've got to start out with an important $2 million eBay scam that just victimized 117 eBay users. Uh, this is serious stuff, folks. You've got to make sure that you know the warning signs so that you, your family members, and friends don't get caught up in this. So let's go straight into it, and then we're going to go into some other primetime crime stories. All right, so the feds have just indicted. They've charged the man you see here, Ionet Ghania from Romania, as being the suspected money mule in a $1.85 million eBay fraud scheme. And I'll show you why in a moment we could consider this a $2 million eBay fraud scheme. Now, if you've not heard of the term money mule before, it's a common term used in scams. And it basically refers to somebody who has the responsibility of going somewhere to collect the money that's part of the scam and then to disperse that to other people who are also part of the scam. So this person is alleged to have been operating as part of a conspiracy that involved placing fake ads for vehicles on various social media sites, various places online for vehicles that he and the others who allegedly placed these ads did not own. Uh, but they established a line of communication with these people uh, through these online uh, ads, and then they directed them to eBay to bid in auctions for these vehicles. And so the important thing with that is that they were able to establish a line of communication outside of eBay, which is really important because eBay does try to protect people who buy on the site by monitoring communications. And that does help to decrease scams. But if scammers could establish a communication line before the person goes to eBay, well, then after the person makes the purchase, then they could continue that line of communication and eBay would not know about it. So what happened next is that after they bought the vehicles, uh, this person, uh, along with others, is alleged to have uh, told them to wire the money into fake bank accounts. Now, there were a total of 74 fake bank accounts that were set up by this person. There could have been others involved, but this is the person named in the indictment, and this was done through uh, all sorts of stolen identities. So they wired the money into these accounts, and then those people were not going to get that money back. So we had a total of 117 victims, and it's $2 million total that was wired over. The $1.85 million is how much he took out of the accounts. But, you know, I would still consider it a $2 million fraud scheme. So if you do the math, that means for $2 million, 117 victims on eBay sent over to actually wired $15,384 uh, on average. Now, this person is still at large. So hopefully they eventually catch him. These are some pictures of him at a bank where he was either setting up an account or maybe he was trying to withdraw some money or something like that. You know, we'll, I'll update this if, if he gets caught and arrested and that kind of thing. But the thing for now that you uh, relatives and friends need to know is please do not make any transactions for eBay purchases outside of eBay. Now, I did cover in a prior video that uh, eBay was working on allowing wire transfers for people uh, for big high ticket item collectible purchases. Uh, but in those instances, those people would still presumably be going through eBay. eBay likes to be in control of all of the communications. They don't like people going off site 
to make monetary transactions because this is the type of thing that could happen. And unfortunately, very often in these scammer cases, uh, it's very difficult for the victims to get their money back. And it really causes financial disaster that could ruin uh, people's lives. So we've got another indictment here. We've got a Chicago husband and wife who are among six postal workers who are charged in a loan fraud scheme. All six of them are alleged to have applied for business loans for businesses that did not actually exist. Now, four of them are alleged to have applied for state unemployment benefits, even though they were actually employed at the time by USPS and receiving a paycheck. So you can't double dip like that. That is illegal. Now, the couple is alleged to have stolen $25,000 in economic stimulus payments. There were paychecks that were allegedly taken out of people's mailboxes in the neighborhoods and deposited into their account. And yes, we're talking about the economic stimulus payment paychecks. So there was a gas card that was supposed to be used for work purposes that was allegedly used for personal purposes. And uh, there's about $100,000 in fraud uh, that is alleged to have occurred from some of these schemes. So now they face some serious charges. We're talking charges of loan fraud, wire fraud, theft by deception, forgery, and more. Obviously, there could be some significant jail time and fines involved in this. But as I've said many times before, if USPS could just get better control over the fraud that is caused by their own employees, and don't get me wrong, of course, there's lots of awesome employees that do a great job through USPS, uh, but it could probably go a long way to decreasing postage costs. All right. Now, of course, not all cases of fraud against USPS are caused by people who work for USPS. In many instances, it's people from the general public who do bad things like get involved in check washing schemes, which we've talked about that before here uh, in the news broadcast. People who steal the checks often out of the blue collection boxes, but they could also just steal it out of the regular mailboxes. And then they uh, do what is called check washing in which they apply chemicals to the checks and they take the ink off and then they rewrite the checks for a different amount, typically for much more than what was originally written. And then they get it deposited into their uh, own accounts. And so uh, this is just to show one of the sentences for someone who did something like this, 30 months in prison for a uh, bank fraud. Uh, there were 15 victims uh, who were uh, affected by this person, $36,700 in stolen funds, all of which the court has now ordered this person to pay back. But, you know, in many instances like this, the money doesn't get paid back because the person just doesn't have the funds to do it. And as usual, the victims are left, uh, you know, without any recompense. So uh, hopefully uh, victims here could get some money, but uh, just goes to show there are consequences to this type of uh, behavior and crime. All right. So there's an important update in a legal case that all resellers need to pay attention to. It is Chanel versus WGACA. That stands for what goes around comes around. Uh, that's a reselling business that has been selling Chanel products and uh, saying that the Chanel products are authentic. They would guarantee it. Uh, they would uh, get involved in these social media campaigns like hashtags that would have the Chanel name attached to it. And Chanel essentially got fed up and said, you know, you're not authorized by us to be able to promote yourself and link yourself uh, to our business like that. And so they sued four years ago for trademark infringement, false advertising and unfair uh, competition. And uh, WGSA has uh, fought back and uh, we're waiting to see what is ultimately going to happen from this case. But at this point, uh, the update is that uh, Chanel has been demanding uh, financial statements from WGSA dating back to 2018 that its experts use to calculate uh, the profits of this reselling business along with a summary of all of the Chanel branded products, sales, and costs. And the reselling company did not want to release all of this information, but the judge sided with Chanel and ordered this information to be turned over. 
And so uh, we don't have a final decision on the case. I'll, of course, update you when it comes. But uh, there are potential significant implications for reselling uh, when this case uh, goes through, depending on how other companies may want to pursue uh, resellers who resell their products and in their minds uh, too closely associate them with their brand when there's not express permission given for that. All right, let's turn to some positive news here. In the third quarter, USPS has seen an increase in delivery speed. 93% of first-class mail has arrived on time. They're trying to hit 95%, so that's pretty close. Uh, The average time it is taking a package to arrive to its destination is 2.4 days. Now, that's averaging uh, all the different services together, but that's a pretty good number overall. So uh, hopefully they could keep this up as we move into the holidays. All right. Now, I mentioned this was coming in a prior video, but it is now official as of August 1st, 2022. USPS has announced that retail ground and parcel select ground products are going to get to their destination faster for the same price. Instead of taking two to eight days to get to where it's supposed to go, it's now going to take two to five days. Sounds great. Let's hope they could deliver on that promise. Oh boy, that was a bad dad joke. (laughs) All right, so here's an important FedEx update. I think a lot of people are going to like this because they're going to do something that Amazon does in which they are going to photograph your package to prove it was delivered. Now, I know from people who use this program through Amazon that, uh, you know, having that photographic proof isn't always something that's foolproof to protect yourself in claim cases, but it's better to have it than not. So uh, that's going to be coming around the time of the holidays. It's going to be released in select markets in the US and Canada, and then probably coming to an area near you soon. So look out for it. Uh, You should be able to eventually see that when tracking your package. All right, so another important update from FedEx, they are shifting from testing mode to adoption mode for their rollout of their electric vehicle delivery trucks. So there's 150 of these trucks that are going to be rolling out across Los Angeles. And then if everything goes according to plan, they're gonna be coming to an area near you soon. How soon? Well. According to FedEx, by 2030, their goal is to have a 100% electric vehicle truck fleet. All right, back to Chicago, specifically the Palos Hills area. Uh, If you have ever wondered what it looks like to see cartons of mail uh, all over the street because they were left unsecured uh, by the post office, well, I'm going to show you what that looks like right now. Look at this. All this mail on the street. So anyone that had packages and they're in Chicago and the one delivered, I'm sorry, but you're not getting your packages. The video posted on TikTok by Amar Nasser. He owns a nearby hookah business. He heard a loud noise and ran over to see what happened. He saw this, crates of packages and mail lining the street on Harlem. He immediately called police. The latch of the box truck fell off and the driver took off, dropping mail onto the street. (laughs) The driver actually, his door fell off. The back door fell off and everything started tumbling over. And he continued driving. (laughs) Amar says he saw packages spotted for miles down Harlem. He's just hopeful all of this mail eventually finds its rightful home. USPS is promising the delivery of all that mail by the end of the day. We are live in Palos Hills. Marissa Perlman, CBS News. Oh, yeah, I trust that. I trust that it's going to all be delivered by the end of the day. I mean, come on. I don't get that. How do you keep driving for miles when six of those gigantic metal crates fall off the back of the truck. I don't know how you don't hear that, how you don't know that all that stuff has fallen off. Oh my goodness, what a mess. All right, everyone, here it is. The moment you have all been waiting on the edge of your seats for all year, eBay's newest sweepstakes, the business coaching giveaway sweepstakes move over ed mcmahon you have nothing compared to this forget the million dollars or more ebay is going to give you three one hour coaching sessions which of course are priceless 
uh, you're going to get an in-house business advisor, uh, one or more, who's going to do these coaching sessions with you, and they're going to analyze your store and provide you with personalized feedback. Now, let me guess. The winner will be told to use or increase promoted listings. Ding, 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 ding. I think I got that right. I think I got that right. So even if you don't win the sweepstakes, I just probably told you one of the main things that you'll hear from one of those reviews. So um, if you want to enter, though, you got to go to eBay for Business. Uh, that's their Facebook page. And each Tuesday for the next four weeks, uh, there'll be a question that's asked and you leave a comment and you can be entered uh, for a chance to win. So uh, good luck, everyone. All right, so one of the things you might also hear if you won one of those sweepstake calls is uh, eBay might try to lead you towards their uh, digital collectible space on the website. That's what an NFT is, a non-fungible token. It's a digital collectible. And some of these are quite expensive. And as we know, eBay is trying to uh, move the direction of their business more towards these high value buyers and into this digital marketplace. And this story just goes to show how seriously they are taking this because they have acquired what they refer to as a leading NFT marketplace known as Known Origin. So uh, this company is now going to be partnering with eBay to create these NFTs uh, to be uh, sold on the marketplace. And so you know, uh, we'll see how this evolves. But, uh, you know, like I said, they are taking this seriously. All right. Now, speaking of the eBay vault where you could store items right now that are priced at $750 and above, and we're talking about trading cards at this point, but it can expand in the future to other types of items and also to lower value items in the future. Uh, but uh, the thing I want you to be aware of, because there are many sellers who are also buyers who are looking to make investments, is that if you try to get involved with buying things that are currently in the eBay vault, uh, there are going to be some very different fees that you are not used to on eBay. You might be used to them if you uh, use similar types of uh, programs to other companies, but it could definitely be a shock to you. Uh, if you're using it uh, through eBay for the first time, because what happens is when you go to withdraw something uh, from this vault, they're going to charge you what's called an instant transfer fee. And that instant transfer fee is going to be 3% of the last purchase price of the item. Now, if you want the item shipped to your address, let's say you want to withdraw it from the vault. Well, now eBay is going to charge you an instant transfer fee, a withdrawal fee, and an insured shipping fee. So that's a lot of fees. Like, let's just look at the withdrawal fee for a second. Right now, um, it would be because you could only do $750 and above for an item price at this moment. So you're talking just the withdrawal fee alone for that is $35. Now, if you sell, if you just strictly sell in the vault, you will not pay fees uh, if you're selling items that are already uh, already stored within it. Um, so, you know, it could be good in that situation, but uh, my goodness, I mean, that's a lot of money. And now you could see uh, with all these fees why eBay wanted to get involved in this vault system because uh, that is going to add up big time. All right, so you're all aware of the problems with uh, staffing shortages that have affected businesses and organizations all across the country. Well, things have gotten so bad in Maine that all of the Maine Goodwill locations have stopped accepting donations until July 5th because they don't have anyone to process the stuff or uh, they don't have enough people. So uh, that's that's when you know it's really bad, when they're no longer taking donations. All right, so this next story is about what not. There's a company called Scout Comics that was criticized for selling retailer-exclusive variant covers directly on the Whatnot platform itself. 
Now, if you're not familiar with these terms, basically what it means is that uh, retailers will sometimes spend large amounts of money to buy regular standard comic book covers. So they get an opportunity to get some of the uh, more exclusive variant covers that are in lower print runs. So for example, if they bought 100 standard comic books, uh, they could get one of these exclusive variant covers. In that instance, that is called a one in 100 variant book. And that's something that's very appealing for customers, uh, especially if they're only available in these local comic book stores that brings those consumers into the store. They're less likely, of course, to go to the retailer if they could find those comic books at other places. Now, one of the places that Scout Comics does sell some of these variants is in their own store. Now, they have their own website, and they say that they wait several months until after the retailers get these books before they sell them, even though they don't have to do that. But in terms of them putting them on whatnot, when the retailers are supposed to have them, they don't deny it. They basically just say in their response that, well, our participation and whatnot has caused increased scrutiny. Yeah, you bet it has. So it's really important, I think, that when companies are offering things to retailers, that they're not trying to directly compete with them. Uh, maybe that's not their intent, but that's essentially what they're doing by selling them onto another platform. And now whatnot is just making this uh, uh, visible so everybody can see it. Uh, so uh, it's either got to be exclusive to the stores or not. All right. I always love these stories when someone gets something in the mail that was sent to them decades ago. Now, normally when we hear of this, it's one item, one or two items. But in this instance, a woman got a postcard from her late mom that was sent from her 1960s honeymoon. And then she just kept getting more mail from the dead. So uh, let's go into this story for a moment and uh, see a little bit more about what happened. And Carol Hover, who lives near Rochester, says it started in early April. That's when she got a postcard written by her mother and dated 1960 when her parents were on their honeymoon in Canada. Well, now she's received five pieces of mail, including letters and one postcard sent from New York City by her father in 1969. And there's no definitive answer yet about why the mail was delivered decades later. They said, well, do you know, you know, Jim and Peg, the, you know, the people that sent it. And I'm like, those were my parents. They've both passed. And she goes, oh, my God, gosh, we have two more in the back. While the U.S. Postal Service said in situations like these, the postcards or letters are usually found by someone or purchased at a flea market or antique shop, then deposited in a collection box. Wow, that is fascinating and interesting to know that the post office will still deliver mail to people based on postage that was paid at the time. If you drop it into the post office nowadays, I'm assuming that only works for uh, postcards and mail that doesn't have a cancel mark on it already. Although I don't know, let me know your comments uh, down below, uh, your thoughts on that one, that's interesting. All right, so this is just starting to become a tradition at the end of the show for our last story. Once again, FedEx comes to the rescue, uh, saves the day. Uh, check out what this FedEx delivery driver did when he came upon a front door entrance that had too much snow on it. There he goes, picks up the shovel and just shovels the lady's walkway. How awesome is that? And not just like one shovel. Get this man some cocoa. All right, now speaking of cocoa, if you have not tried this before, here's some breaking news for you. Get some soft serve vanilla chocolate or vanilla chocolate swirl ice cream and put cocoa pebbles on it as the topping. Not cocoa crispies, cocoa pebbles. It's out of this world, amazing stuff. Let me know some of your offbeat, unusual ice cream topics down below because I probably will go out and try it. Uh, with that, I'm going to lightly toss this because it's past two o'clock in the morning now, 
And I don't want this to wake up Mrs. Primetime or she will get mad at me. So let's just lightly toss the book over here this time here. I think we're good. Oh, no. <laughs> and I thought we were safe that time. Darn it. Uh, all right, everyone. I got to go clean up. I'll see you at the next one, everyone. Take care.